Okay. I want to welcome you to the first full installment of A Call for Discernment. This session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. Uh, this session we will be looking at the metaphysical cultic origins of the movement and the standard doctrines which the faith preachers espouse that deviate from Orthodox Christianity. So where did the Word of Faith movement begin? Well, it began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. Now let me define a couple of terms here for us. When I say metaphysical, I know that's a big $3 word, but really all metaphysical means is beyond the physical realm, beyond what we can see. And when I say cult, you might have images of people dressed in black robes, wearing a black hood, standing around a pentagram, worshiping Satan. That would qualify, but that's not what we mean here by cult. A, a quote-unquote Christian cult is any group or sect that calls itself Christian, and yet they deny some of the fundamental doctrines of the faith. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses belong to a cult. Mormonism is a cult because they compromise, deny some of the fundamentals of our faith. So. Quimby, the great-grandfather of the Word of Faith movement, was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. He was also a student of occultism, hypnosis, and parapsychology. And I believe that much of the behavior that we'll look at in the next session, mangled manifestations, can be attributed to some of these disciplines. His theoretical formulation served as the basis for the mind science cult, also known as Christian science, which was founded properly by Mary Baker Eddy, and his theoretical formulations later served as a basis for the theology of the modern Word of Faith movement. So Quimby is the one that first began to articulate some of the doctrines that we see today. Essek W. Kenyon is the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Uh, Kenyon is recognized by all your modern prosperity preachers as uh, the grandfather of this movement, they would all appeal to Kenyon. And I've been in Kenneth Copeland's bookstore before. You look in there and there's Essex Kenyon material all over the shelves. And uh, Kenyon himself had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly New Age and New Thought. He was heavily influenced by them. He attended college at the Emerson School of Oratory where the metaphysical cults were pl prominent and they flourished. Now, I want us to look at a few of the doctrines that Kenyon taught. Number one, Kenyon taught that God created not ex nihilo, as we call it, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. And we as believers can do the same thing. Kenyon held essentially that faith was a tangible substance, and when God spoke, his words were containers of the substance called faith, almost like Tupperware containers that carried the substance of faith. So his words of faith is what created the worlds and everything that we see. And we as believers can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence to create our own physical reality. Kenyon held that humans took on the nature of Satan in the fall. When this happened, they forfeited to Satan their supposed deity and made Satan the legal god of planet Earth. Kenyon held that Jesus died not only a physical death, but he also died a spiritual death, where Jesus suffered, was tormented in hell, died spiritually, and had to be reborn. And that is where the real atonement of our sins took place, not on the cross, but in hell. And finally, Kenyon held that health and wealth are obtainable by the believer's positive confession. So if we need money, we can speak it into existence. If we need healing, we can speak it into existence. Kenyon did hold to many of the fundamental doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. However, what's happened in the modern Word of Faith movement is that your modern prosperity preachers like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland have taken Kenyon's mistakes and made them much worse. So compared to your modern prosperity preachers, Essex W. Kenyon was actually fairly orthodox. Some of you may remember this gentleman. William Branham was the father of the post-World War II healing 
revival movement. Branham is the one that first began to popularize some of these tent healing meetings. Let's look at some of his doctrines. Branham taught that only those who accepted his teachings would be saved. So if you disagreed with William Branham, then you were just out of luck. Branham held that Eve had relations with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Branham thought very highly of himself. He proclaimed himself to be the angel of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. He just read himself right into Scripture. And Paul Crouch, founder and president of TVN a few years ago, did the very same thing. Paul Crouch said, said that he found his name hidden in an Old Testament Bible code using equidistant lettering. So Paul Crouch reads himself right into God's Word, too. Branham prophesied that all of the world's denominations would be consumed by the Roman Catholic-controlled World Council of Churches. And Branham said that this would happen in 1977, just before the rapture and the destruction of the world. Well, guess what didn't happen? And finally, Branham taught that the doctrine of the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. Listen to the following audio clip of William Branham and then listen to Benny Hinn's endorsement of him. Now, my precious brother, I know this is a tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. It's too close hey, to the coming, man. See? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus saith the Lord. God uses normal individuals. Whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or Amy or A. Allen or William Branham. Great men of God. There you just heard Benny Hinn, one of the most widely recognized individuals, leaders in Christianity today, call William Branham a great man of God. This is a man who denounced the Trinity as a demonic doctrine. There's an astonishing lack of discernment in our churches today. And uh, William Branham died, as you see, in 1965. He had prophesied that he would be raised from the dead when he did die, and believe it or not, to this very day, uh, in at Branham's tomb place, they'll, uh, there's a small group of Branhamites that will gather every Easter Sunday morning around his tomb waiting for that old boy to come back up. And uh, I think they'll be waiting for quite a while. Kenneth Hagin is the father of the modern Word of Faith movement. And uh, though Kenneth Hagin claimed that no believer should die before age 120, you see that he died here at age 86. Now, Kenneth Hagin, like almost all of the Word of Faith preachers, claim that much of what they teach you, they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge from Jesus himself. And this is almost like their fallback position and their way of insulating themselves from any biblical criticism. And they'll say essentially that, well, if you can't find what I'm teaching you in the Word, don't worry about it, you see, because I have it from the highest authority. Jesus himself came and gave me these teachings. And um, Kenneth Hagin claimed to have received eight personal visitations from Christ. And in one of these visitations, Jesus supposedly gave him the following teaching. Um, this deals with what we'll look at in a little bit called the spiritual death of Jesus. But Hagin claimed that he received these words directly from Jesus himself. It's interesting, however, that Jesus bears a striking resemblance to Essex W. Kenyon. If you can see here, it's practically word for word identical. Hagen did not receive this from Jesus. Hagen plagiarized Essex W. Kenyon. And this is just all I could fit on the screen, but this information is quite voluminous. It goes on and on and on. Uh, Hagen did not receive this from Christ. He plagiarized Kenyon. And yet, listen to the following audio clip of Gloria Copeland perpetuating this myth. You say, why do y'all talk so much about Kenneth Hagin when you do this? Because he's where we learned how to walk in the Spirit, how we learned what we learned. How did he know it? 
he had the very unusual experience of Jesus himself coming to teach him these things, and then he called him to teach all of us. And so that's why, and that's where we learn it. It'll be a blessing to you. The faith preachers are very fond of claiming divine origin for what they teach, yet you can see the origins of their teachings are not nearly so supernatural. Kenneth Copeland is without a doubt one of the most intelligent and articulate proponents of word faith theology, but as we shall see as we go along today, he is also very, very dark. And this man probably needs no introduction. Benny Hinn, uh, the world's greatest quote-unquote faith healer in all the world today. Two of the leading lights in word faith theology. I want to show you this quote now from Essek Kenyon, dealing with occultic origins. Kenyon writes, We cannot ignore the amazing growth of Christian science, unity, new thought, spiritism. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that in many of our cities on the Pacific coast, Mrs. Eddy has a stronger following today and a larger attendance at her churches than have the old line denominations. The people have left them because they believe they are receiving more help from Mrs. Eddy's teaching than from preachers. They will tell you how they were healed and how they were helped in their spiritual life by this strange cult. So by his own admission, Kenyon believed that these metaphysical cults had really tapped into some power. Now he wanted to, and I really think in a good faith effort, he wanted to try to to take some of these cultic doctrines and, and teach them as truth, but he, he just believed that these cults had tapped into some power and we as Christians can have that same power. And so he tried to Christianize some of these cultic doctrines and that remains true to this day. Now let's look at some of the standard doctrines which the faith preachers teach. We will begin with the doctrine of positive confession. Uh, consider these clips as illustrative of this teaching. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you, say, there's power in me, power in me. To, speak life and death. to speak life and death. You call what you have, you say what you want. And I'm here to tell you, I know that I know that I know that as these programs are airing, I, I'm speaking something into existence. Amen. I'm speaking something into existence. If that sounds eerily like God's act of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, that's because it is. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is not an ability that you and I have. And we'll see as we go along that one of the fundamental problems of the faith movement is that the faith preachers blur what should be a very crisp line of distinction between God the Creator and us His created. They demote God to make Him look more human than what He is, and then they deify man to make us look a lot more like God than what we really are. Consider this from Gloria Copeland. Don't see yourself uh, pitiful, depressed, without, broke, Get into the Word. If you're having pro uh, financial problems, get into the Word until you see yourself prosperous. We saw ourselves prosperous before we got prosperous. Now, you may have seen that and you're wondering, well, Justin, what's so bad about that? She's just talking about having a positive outlook on life. No, it's something a bit more serious than that. What she's talking about is something known as visualization. And visualization is a New Age technique in which you visualize things with your mind and when you visualize these things in your mind they will then become physical reality and this by the way is very very similar to what Oprah Winfrey is teaching in this thing called the secret you've heard about Oprah Winfrey promoting the secret see a lot of nodding heads same kind of thing uh, and it, it, these cultic ideas will pop up in different places. It'll pop up in Oprah Winfrey and The Secret, and it'll pop up in Word of Faith and, and the contemplative prayer movement, the emergent movement, and it just, it's the same basic heresy. It just rears its head in, in different places. Uh, to further flesh this out from Gloria Copeland, uh, this quotation from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says, when you get to the place where you take the Word of God and you build an image on the inside of you of not having crippled legs, not having blind eyes, 
But when you close your eyes, you just see yourself leap out of that wheelchair. It will picture that in the Holy of Holies, and you will come out of there. You will come out. So, according to Kenneth Copeland, all I need to do is sit up here and close my eyes and think real hard and imagine myself not having cerebral palsy, not having my crutches, and when I concentrate hard enough, that image will materialize in the Holy of Holies, and then I'll just open my eyes and be healed. Friends, that is foreign to the Word of God. That is foreign to the Word of God. It's right at home in the metaphysical cults, but foreign to God's Word. This from Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn said this on TBN one day. He said, I had a witch tell me this. Now, there's his first problem. <laughs> there's his first problem. Benny Hinn is learning spiritual truths, not from the Bible under the direction of leadership of the Holy Spirit, but from a witch. She said, you know that we are taught in witchcraft how to kill birds with words and how to kill people with our mouth. We were taught with words to bring disease on men by speaking words that would defeat them. She said, with words, I used to kill birds. I used to kill birds. She said she would speak to a bird and the bird would drop dead. I said, dear God, I didn't know the devil had such power. And the Lord spoke to me, notice the source of his authority, and he said, the devil can kill with words, then you with your words can bring life. And it just come and clicked inside of me, brother, and we Christians don't realize the power in our mouths. Dear friends, only God can bring life with the words that he speaks. That is not something that you and I can do. Only God can do that. This from T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes says, That word of God is how God procreates. It's how God regenerates. I didn't know God was decaying. And that's why once you get in the word of God, you've got to be careful what you speak to because the power of life and death is in your tongue. Is this true? Is there any scriptural support that the power of life and death is in our tongue? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. Faith preachers would all appeal to Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Well, it doesn't say right there that the power of life and death is in our tongue. Well, not exactly. Let's, let's be good Bereans, search the scriptures to see if these things are really so. As is common with the faith preachers, they only want to quote to you part of a verse, or if they quote the whole verse, they'll take it out of its context. And that's what's happening here. Let's look at Proverbs 18.21 in its entirety. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So when you look at this verse in its entirety, it doesn't exactly say what the faith preachers claim it does. In fact, I want you to read uh, what Alan P. Ross says about this verse in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says, those who enjoy talking, in other words, indulging in it, must bear its fruit, whether good or bad. The lesson is to be warned, especially if you love to talk. You see, dear friends, this verse is not saying that we have the power of life and death. In our, like, we can't, it's not saying we can speak life into existence. This is a warning to us. So, in other words, if you're one of those people that likes to uh, talk a little bit too much, or you like to gossip, indulge in gossip, uh, you better be ready to bear the consequences of it. This is not saying we can speak life and death. This is a warning. It is a caution. Consider these clips. Birds are containers for power. They carry creative or destructive power, positive or negative power. And so we need to be speaking right things over our lives and about our futures if we expect to have good things happen. Because what you say today is what you'll probably end up having tomorrow. Speak with your mouth what you believe in your heart. You'll have whatever you say. We don't have to pray for your will, Lord. And that same Holy Spirit wants to send spiritual light to a darkened world today. But he's waiting for you and me to say, Oh, that spoken word is the key. Speak that thing. Decree that thing and it shall come to pass, whatever it is in your life that you're decreeing right now. As we speak a thing together, it intensifies it. it. As John says, it supercharges it. You've got to say it. You've got to speak it. You've got to s decree it. You decree the thing. You pay your vow, and then he brings it to pass. It's in the Word. It's all through the book. What do you need? I need money. Then start creating it. Start speaking about it. 
Start speaking it into being. Speak to your billfold. Say, you big, thick billfold full of money. Speak to your checkbook. Say, you checkbook, you've never been so prosperous since I owned you. You're just jammed full of money. You've got pain and disease in your body. Speak to your body. God will create the fruit of your lips. Say to your body, your whole body. Why, you just function so beautifully and so well. Why, body, you never have any problems. You're a strong, healthy body. Or speak to your leg, or speak to your foot, or speak to your neck, or speak to your back. And once you have spoken, believe that you've received, and don't go back on it. Speak to your wife, speak to your husband, speak to your circumstances, and speak faith to them, to pray to them, and God will create what you're speaking. So, according to Marilyn Hickey, next time you find yourself a little low on cash, don't worry about it, just reach into your pocket, back pocket, pull out your wallet, and start talking to it. Y'all be sure and let me know how that works out for you. Well, what if this doctrine that faith is a substance that we can manipulate, is, is there any truth to this? Is there any scriptural support? Well, upon first consideration, it might would seem so. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, it doesn't say right there that faith is a substance. Well, we'll come back to this verse, but first I want you to listen to this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul Crouch. Well, the force of faith is, in the spiritual realm, a great deal like certain forces in the natural realm. It's a spiritual force, like gravity is a natural force, electricity is a mm. natural force of power. It's mm -hmm. a powerful thing. A measurable, natural yeah, force. It's a measurable uh, mm -hmm. force. It's conductible, mm -hmm. it's perceptible to the touch. Uh, faith is a spiritual force. It's perceptible. It's, uh, it is a tangible force. It's an invisible force. So is gravity, mm -hmm. but it's there. So is electricity. So according to Keith Copeland, faith is a physical, tangible force. Well, let's go back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, but this time I want us to look at it in the New American Standard translation. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A little bit different take on Hebrews 11.1, 1, is it not? Well, the word in question here that the King James renders as substance and the New American Standard renders as assurance in the Greek is the word hypostasis. And the word hypostasis literally means assurance. That's what that word means. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Now, am I saying that the King James is wrong? Nope, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, the King James isn't wrong, it's just that English has evolved quite a bit in the last 400 years. Somebody reading the King James rendering of that 400 years ago would have understood perfectly well what the intent was. But our language has just changed. That word has a different connotation today than it did back then. So the word literally means assurance. It does not mean a physical, tangible substance. Consider this audio clip of Kenneth Copeland and Paul and Jan Crouch. Does God use faith? Surely. Now, now see, here's a sore spot. There are those not with who him. say. Not with, not, not with you. No, no, no. <laughs> not with God. I'm not, in fact, I'm not sore at God at all, and I don't think he's sore at me. I don't know. I haven't done anything to him. <laughs> no, but the, the critics say God is God. He doesn't have to have faith. He doesn't exercise faith. He doesn't use faith. He's God. He's the object of faith. Oh, wait a minute. What does that mean, object? I don't know what that means. I don't either. Kenneth Copeland said, now, wait a minute. What's that mean, God's the object of our faith? I don't know what that means. And then you hear Jan Crouch say, well, I don't either. Friends, that's not meat. That's milk. The fact that God is the object of our faith, that's first grade Sunday school stuff. And it's astonishing to me that these people who claim to be some of our leaders don't understand the elementary truth that God is the object of our faith. Because you see, in their system, he's not the object of faith. Faith is the object of faith. You see, in word faith theology, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force. 
that you direct at God to make him do what you want him to do. And it's rather ironic when you think about it that these people who call themselves faith preachers have a fundamental misunderstanding of what faith actually is. The following video clip is one of the more bizarre clips I've ever come across dealing with the doctrine of positive confession. This from Gloria Copeland. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. You can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computers, got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that, but you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it. It never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying. And we were not in the weather, because we don't fly bad weather. But we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this. And that tornado went, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Even while I was watching him, my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. <laughs> so you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it, you're not coming here, I command you to dissipate, and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. That almost doesn't even really deserve a comment, but I will offer one briefly. If it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather by the words that she speaks, then I would submit to you that Gloria Copeland is one of the most wretched people alive on the face of the earth today. Might we ask where she was when a little storm named Hurricane Katrina rolled into town? Might we ask where she was just a couple weeks ago when Hurricane Ike rolled in? Why does she not right now get on her brand new $25 million private jet and fly to some of these drought-stricken countries in Eastern Africa and talk those starving people up some rain? This is what is being portrayed as Christian. And let us remember that what much of the world believes about Christianity, it gets from Christian television. And this is what it's seen. Speaking to storms and making them go away, does it remind you of someone else who one day was in a boat with his disciples and a storm came up and he spoke to the storm and calmed it? Sound familiar? You see what the faith preachers are doing. They are blurring that line between God the Creator and us His created. For a little bit different take on the account of Jesus speaking to storms and making them go away. This from Joel Osteen. One time Jesus was on a boat asleep and all of a sudden this huge storm arose. And the winds were so strong. And they were batting the boat back and forth. And the disciples got all upset and all afraid. And they finally ran back there and said, Jesus, get up. We're about to die. We're about to perish. And Jesus got up and he simply spoke to the storm. He said, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, there was a great calm. And the reason Jesus was able to bring peace to that situation was because he had peace on the inside. He was in the storm, but he didn't let the storm get in him. Jesus was able to speak to the storm because he had peace on the inside. Now, I'm going to go out on a theological limb here and wonder, might it have had anything to do with the fact that